Laura McGoldrick, it is really so fun to be sitting down with you. I DM'd you and was like, hey, because I'd found an excuse to interview you. And I'm like, hey, do you want to come on the podcast? And you're like, sweet ass. Like, yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> I rang mum. I was like, you're not going to believe who's asked to interview me. <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, and one of the reasons why we get to talk today is because we live in New Zealand so physically it's possible, but we live in New Zealand, so our sun is really, really strong. And I am somebody who is blessed with moles. I have so many moles, I believe it's a condition. It gets an actual, it gets its actual, and it has an actual name. It would be what good is at, it? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't know what the name is. I don't know what the name is. But it's a condition. Probably some bloke's name. Yeah, right. Oh, lots of moles. That's the condition I'll name after me. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll find out. It definitely has a name, surely it has a name. Surely. Yeah, but, but it, it's signified by having more than 100 moles on your left arm. If you have more than 100 moles on arm. your left arm, you're in, lady. My husband's going to come home tonight and I'm going, 97, 98, 99. <laughs> the hell are you doing? Just counting my moles on my left arm. I'm just seeing if I've got the special condition. <laughs> and um, so I'm somebody who grew up when my mum was a big sunbather. She was yep. like, yeah, sunbather. being brown is like beautiful and healthy and good. And she did look really good, brown. So we ran around outside and she was a very responsible woman, as far as I recollect. Yeah. We didn't climb too high on the trees and didn't drown in anything or anything, but... I spent a lot of time outside in the sun, and we did that whole Kiwi Beach Christmas. And I remember coming across a mole that I kept an eye on, and it was my, um, yeah, it's my, my arm out the door mm. hand, so my right hand. <laughs> See, I just go left there. Oh, yeah, my definitely. right hand. My right hand, and um, one week, three people mentioned it to me. They were like, I'm not sure about that mole. And the funny thing is I had noticed it, like, oh, I think that might have changed. And so I went and whipped it off, and it came back as a melanoma in situ. So stage one caught it and we went back and then we cut a whole bunch of flesh out and made sure we got the whole thing to get rid of it and so now I'm on mole watch and and at Christmas just before this Christmas I had to go and get another three cut out they're all fine but I am in pincushion status now as a human being anytime somebody's upset with a mole I'm like get it out and I said Damish oh, those three moles were fine Three more moles. <laughs> I have got hardly any. I've only got 1,050, 562 left. <laughs> Can't keep giving them away like this. <laughs> anyway, he's like, nah, every time they say there's a mole, it has to come off. You just have to take it off. Get that. But you're a melanoma ambassador. Mm. What is your intersection with melanoma? So um, I come from a very big, beautiful family, uh, and we're based in the South Island. And one of my cousins, one of my... Um, beautiful cousins by the name of Amelia. Uh, when she was 12, she was diagnosed with melanoma and she had a mole on her face. It was a very rare form of melanoma. And uh, we were the same age, 11, 12, I think, when she f first had her first mole cut out. And then it just got worse and worse and worse and they didn't get it early enough and it spread around her body and um, she passed away. And I remember watching that as a kid, watching parts of her flesh be taken off her body and different surgeries she had to have. and it was that was horrific and you know our family is incredibly close and it was something that we you know wrote out together and it was it just the one the, the older that you get you know that it's wrong that it happens to a child it's absolutely wrong and it shouldn't happen but it does and so for me and my family we all now are extra careful in the sun um, and uh, roll on to when I got married. My husband, um, his father, Peter, uh, passed away just before our daughter was born, um, and he had melanoma as well. He was a truck driver, his arm in the in the sun when he was driving around all the time, and he, he had melanoma as well. So it's something that we're acutely aware of. Um, we are big into the six-monthly mole checks. We go and get our moles checked. Very important. It's in the calendar every year. And I'll ring and I'll do the family. I'll d book the whole family. That's my role. I'm happy for that to be my role. So I'll ring. Dad, what times and dates are you? This is what's available. Mum, boys, my brothers. Go. Really? My husband. Yeah. The whole family. I'm the mole checker. Really? Well, I don't check them personally because I'm... <laughs> I really know what I'm doing. That's a pretty one. But, but uh, yeah, so so um, melanoma um, has affected my family in, in more ways than one. And um, so it's just something that, you know, if we can raise more awareness around it. And I think, you know, people know to keep sunscreen on in the sun, but it's, it's the reapplication of it. Um, for me, as a woman as well now, from a more, um, you know, cosmetic 
sort of how I look. Where I now put it on as one of the things I put on in the morning is my sunscreen. Um, Winter SPF summer. fifty. It doesn't matter. Every single day, yeah. you've just got to, um, because I don't. You know, I'll, I'll you've got to take care of your skin. Um, yeah, it's an amazing thing, skin. It's an all I'll do. It's wild. It lets some things in and keeps most things out, and it keeps all of us in. And it lets some things out. It's just freaky. It's w- the, the freakiest I ever thought it was was during pregnancy. When you're watching this thing grow at your stomach, you're like, what in the... Is this going to go back? <laughs> what is this? Just the give. Come on, you the give. I mean, I've worn some stretchy pants before, but not like this. <laughs> not like this. It's good. Yeah, so skin is amazing. So the least we can do is take care of it. I know. I hear it described sometimes as our largest organ. I never thought about it like that. I know. That's, I think it's quite a nice way to think of it yeah. as our largest organ. I mean, like, really, it's freaking fantastic. And it has so many different layers. And it has different layers in different bits of our bodies, eh? Yeah. Like, like on our face, it's, like, thinner, which is a shame. It's but, a real shame. <laughs> especially on these ears, I can do with a bit of this thing but, but, but I don't really think you can. But maybe it's also good because maybe then there's a little more flex and stuff. Mm. But it is profound. Yeah, it's quite... Scary thing, but I I think and this is going to sound weird, but I think having kids, I'm noticing it more, is how incredible the healing. So like when they scrape their knee or whatever, you're like, wow, <laughs> wow, and it heals from the inside yeah. out. Yeah, it just heals underneath up. I'm not. I can't pick scabs. Like scabs creep me out. Yeah. I, I don't know why because I'm not very mature. But heart, my daughter will be like, Mum, I'll just. Pick. I'm like, no, 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 leave it, leave it, leave it. Now you got it. You let your body take. <laughs> That's don't, please don't forget, please don't forget. That's good. Are you a scarer or a non-scarer? I can scar. Um, yeah. So I had two, two caesareans and I've got a wicked scar, which I love. I'm very proud of. Um, and that hasn't healed quite as I imagined it would. But in other areas, different parts of my body heal differently. Yeah. I'm what you call an overhealer. Oh. Yeah, so I just heal too much, it turns out. Like, we used to blame, I've, I ran through a plate glass window as a kid, and I've got this what's called a bubble scar. It's where the skin looks like it's sort of bubbled on the oh, shoulder. Okay. And my dad was like, oh, the doctor was useless, took, took the stretches out too early. And it turns out, no, it's just me. I'm really, like, slightly too good, a.k.a. not good at healing, overheal. Yeah. So then my $5,000 scar, which is supposed to be a thin line, is that it's supposed to look like that. But actually, it looks like that. Oh, wow, we. Yeah. Which I reckon I should get a tattoo on it, because it looks like a leaf. It does look like a leaf. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that was, that's my, that was the first one that we caught. Did you even notice, like, like, can you tell me what it was like with you and Pete? Like, you, you know, you're just carrying on. You're married. Pete's your father-in-law. He's a truck driver. He's just a good Kiwi bloke. Well, the beautiful thing about Peter is he was your classic Kiwi guy in a lot of ways. Loved his sport, loved cricket. He was like a club legend. He played for Suburbs New Lynn and he was, everyone knows Peter Gupta. He's such a good cricketer and a good bloke. He'd give you the shirt off his back. He's just the kindest guy you've ever met. Um, and he was always a, she'll be right. Peter is, you know, she'll be right. Peter, you've got a little scab thing on your arm. The, oh, she'll be right. Just keep picking it and it'll go away eventually. You know, she'll be right. She'll be right. Um, and probably didn't get things checked out when he should have and probably had a headache because he had, um, it started as melanoma and then we caught it in the secondary, which was in uh, his brain, he had some brain tumours um, as a consequence of the melanoma and had spread, but he didn't, because he was a Shelby Wright, there was no knowing that this is where it started and, and um, yeah, so. So when you found it, did, did they leave the skin alone or did they, cut, did they start chopping bits of peat out or did they just go, hey? So, no, so they didn't know it had come from, his, from there initially because the first thing they found was the brain the, tumours because of what it was pressing on in his brain and it was causing some issues for him, forgetfulness, those types of things. Um, and that was where they first caught it. And by that stage, um, it was a, a little bit too late for Peter. He, um, they tried him on a, a, that drug Keytruda, that, but it was just it was just too little, too late for Peter, which was horrific because we always talk about how good a grandfather he would have been, and that would have been lovely to watch him step into that role. Yeah, um, and sixties, sixties too young these days. Oh they? my gosh, it's far, far too young. And the damage was done back back when. It's not like he he you know. D- made some bad decisions as a as a 58 59 year old no. and just stayed out a little long you no. actually it's cumulative isn't it oh, which is where so. i guess um for our generation my generation more than more than you because i think we were way more sunscreen oriented perhaps just even a decade later decade two decades um 
but, but we were sunbathers. I grew up as a sunbather. That's just what we do. We just lay in the sun. We mm. sunbathed at high school. We sunbathed. Sunbathing was just like a pastime. Oh, yeah. Getting your tan on was still important in my um, you know, age group. But I guess fake tan had come into play. Sunbeds were just starting to eke out. They weren't such a thing anymore. Um, but, boy, nothing is as bad as a bad fake tan is there, my <laughs> If that goes awry <laughs> around the feet and the hands, it's no good. And I tell you what, there was some the elbows and the very knees. experimental <laughs> times of where you're putting it on. Um, but no, um, yeah, being being tan was important. Um, but I think people need to realise that you can still tan, but with sunscreen on, you, know, you can. You, you can. just tan you just, slowly. You just will. So it's almost like how do you how do you avoid the first burn as mm. well? Like you know, it's it's summer and you're keen and you want. You, you, we're told, yep, get some vitamin D in your skin. Yeah. Um, you feel better if you're a little shade darker. Lots of people do. Thinner. Um, <laughs> Five very kilos, thinner. easy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that going out and just, oh, whoops a days, you know, just got sunburned. That's supposedly, like, quite bad. Yeah, the, there, are, there does seem to be a lot of whoops a daisies um, that, you, that you, you hear about in terms of the sunburn. And, oh, it's good. It's just my first burn. It's just my first burn of the summer. She'll be right. She'll be right. But it's, it's not. It's, this is when you need to be wearing your sunscreen every single day. That's why it's good practice just to put it on your face every single day. Um, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'm grateful that I'm coming into the better fake tans that you can get. Um, and it's less of a thing to say. People still want to lie in the sun, absolutely. But I think there's maybe a little more knowledge around how that's not always so great. I lie in the sun covered up. Yeah, yeah, basically. Like, I still a, like, have a, like my, an amumu. A little bit. Yeah. Um, I've got lots of wraps, Turkish towels, those oh. lovely linen-y towels. Oh, yeah. Drape them over Caftan, your legs. I, Is that, no, 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 I should get one of those. You need to get one of those caftans. That'd things. be nice. My mum's going through a bit of a tablecloth era. You know, that, that seems to be like that sort of, I don't know, what do you call it, like crochet, crochet, there oh. we are. Yeah. And I always say to her every time she puts it on, I'm like, I feel like Nana had that on it. <laughs> she doesn't like that. Well, don't put that in. No, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> Sorry, Mum, love you. Um, she brought me one for Christmas. Oh, actually, did so she? I can join in. Oh, there you go. So, very grateful. Thanks, Mum. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that because I basically am like, with my situation where I, I've had one show up, I'm like on watch now. I have to be because the damage was done back then. Mm. I'm not, it's not like, oh, I got too much sun last summer. It's like back 20 years ago yeah. when I was less wise, yes. I was lying in the sun or or not blocking in winter, or not blocking at different times, or not covering up soon enough, or getting burnt. And I'm going to reap the rewards of that now. So I have to be on guard. So essentially it's like, it's an interesting thing to try and even get your head around, mm. like, I shouldn't sunbathe. Like, I'm not sure if I'm there yet. But I have kind of tuned into my skin will go, no more sun. Like, it literally, at the end of the day, summer day will be like, get the sun off me. Yeah. Like, you can feel it just... So it's like, oh, how can I be in the sun but just, like, covered up? Like, just, just wearing stuff. Like yeah. Light, breezy stuff. Light, breezy. Easy breezy. Easy breezy. Easy breezy cover girl. Cold in it. But I suppose the good thing about it now is um, is there is ways that you can keep tabs on everything that you have got on your body, like the mole check. Um, that, and that's so important. And, yeah, it's, yeah, it costs money, but, you know, how much does your house cost? You know, you have to just weigh up those things. And even if you can't do it every six months, do it every year. But it's so, impo- it's so important to keep tabs on. And, then, you know, they keep the photos for you. So if you're thinking to yourself, like, I remember very distinctly, I had one on my arm, and I was like, that either hasn't been there as long as I remember, I've completely lost my mind, or it's changed significantly. I don't know which one it is. And um, it was exactly the same. I was just panicking. Um, because they had the photos from when I started getting my moles mapped years ago. And I think with technology these days, I could literally start a file in my camera that says moles in it. Mm. And, and I take a photo of some moles every now and again. Yeah, hell of a thing for a person to pick up your phone and go, she's got a mole folder. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> I think I want I want one because I literally was like I was looking at my foot the other day and I'm like holy I've never seen that mole there and it's dark it's yeah. new and it's dark that's that's was a warning sign food? it was a small scab <laughs> <laughs> I'm like do I pick off this real faux mole or do I do I wait and see and I was like it's itchy it's itchy because of course it was a healing scab <laughs> I was good to go though I should pat myself on the you back should. for well my done. vigilance well done. yeah that is yeah that's but and that's important. So this she'll be right thing is a, is kind of a it's one of our ways of being in the world mm. as Kiwis, mm. which we celebrate, like you know not not making a fuss, not 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 drawing too much attention to ourselves, but it does have a few drawbacks I think, like obviously, you know, 
losing Pete is a massive drawback and the fact that maybe we don't invite men to really pay attention to their bodies in a way that is caring. They pay attention to them in a way that is, you know, they can move things or be protective mm. or be strong, but we don't kind of invite men into being curious or kind towards their bodies in a way. Yeah, it's funny, I've never really thought about it like that, but you're absolutely right. We don't encourage men to love their bodies and take care of their bodies like we do. No. It's... Yeah, it's, it's quite a mind shift. I've had um, an interesting relationship with my body over the years, learning to love it. Um, and I don't think I loved it till, you know, I had actually my babies because I was so thankful for what it was able to do. And I was mean to it for a very long time. You know, being a female, what you see, what you think you should look like. Um, how about we just embrace how we actually look and work to that? <laughs> you know, I was trying to be something I wasn't because I'm me. And that's what, that's what makes me so great, you know. Um, the she'll be right thing. I'm getting a bit sick of the she'll be right. Um, to be honest, I think that people need to be celebrated and things you do need to be celebrated. And um, if you don't feel 100%, it is okay to say that. And that's something that I think it's nice to see that more and more people are talking about, especially with men. You hear them talk about that, actually, I'm not okay. And I wish, you know, like Peter had said, hey, I've got these headaches, you know, but didn't want to burden anyone. Yeah. Didn't want to worry anyone. Yeah. But she'll be right. Yeah, it's problematic, eh? Mm. I wonder too, as women, if we've allowed ourselves to care in some ways. But actually, well, when I hear you say I was mean to my body, can you tell me more about that? Oh, yeah. Well, I just, I would either eat lots, not eat as much as I should, exercise too much or just not exercise at all. I didn't have a, I didn't have a balanced relationship with it, so I would almost punish it because I felt like it wasn't doing it what I needed it to do. But actually, I just wasn't looking after myself. I wasn't doing the basic things that my body needs: fuel it in the right way, move it in the right way. And I think that, but that also probably was to do with mental health as well. Like I, you know, I, for me, moving my body has now become sort of like a therapy for me and I, I love that it's my hour a day that I do that's for me no phone no distractions sure I have to get up the crack of dawn before the kids wake up but that's okay I don't mind that I like that I like you know sometimes I like the silence and when you're doing it um, sometimes I really like the music sometimes I need the music as a way to I've never finished a workout and thought god I wish I hadn't done that so that's a nice thing that I know that I need to do for me to make myself feel good about myself it feels like that action is originating out of, I, I like myself, out of a place of acceptance. Yeah. You're not exercising to make your body go away as it is. No. You're exercising to make your body good as it is. Like yeah. To, to be with your body in some way. Yeah. Like it feels like an alliance rather than a cracking the whip. Yeah, I respect my body enough to take care of it in this way now because I've learned over the years that... Um, that it's okay to like what I look like and it's okay to like me um, just as I am. And that's not going to be everyone's cup of tea. That's just the way it is. It doesn't have to be everyone's cup of tea, does it? But if it's not, it's actually none of my business. That's just how you feel about yeah. me and that's absolutely fine. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to... I'm not, I'm not going to... Who fine. cares? I'm certainly not going to lose. There was certainly a period of time when I first started doing what I do where... What do you mean people don't like me? And what do you, I mean, why would they write that down? I'm so nice. Um, but, but they don't know me. I've I'm never met so hard. I've never met them. I'm just trying my best. I'm just out here just trying to make Nana proud, you know, like. Um, and then there was a moment and there was a switch for me and I think it was around having uh, my first child as a wee girl, as um, my daughter. And I was like, this is just not an example I'm comfortable setting for her. I'm, I'm, I want more for her. I want her to grow up loving herself. And there's been certainly times where I'll sort of, you know, try and not walk around the house naked but that's not something I do because I wasn't proud of my body I am now I'm proud of what it's given me yep. I'm proud of how it takes care of me um, I'm proud of what I can do with it yep. I can pump tin you know I'm strong and I'm strong because I've got kids that I want to play with and show them I want the kids come out and work out with me sometimes in the weekends um, that I've got them some little weights these little and they join in and we do it together and you know I want them to know that you you know, everyone, you, you talk about going to a counsellor to help with your mind. Well, the gym is, is sort of like that for your body. It's what it needs to do. It's what it's, well, for me anyway. So um, uh, having a daughter was the catalyst of change for the way I looked at my body for sure. And so I try to walk around the house. <laughs> if I, you know, haven't got a towel for the shower, I'll sort of try and walk past. And on in, the inside, I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. But I'm like, hey, honey. Yeah. And then, you know, try to, because I don't want her to think I've got it. 
I'm ashamed. Of I'm not. I don't. I'm not ashamed of my body. Yeah. No. I, I look like what I look like. Yeah, and it's good. And it's good. It's great, even. Well, I'm gonna go there. No. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go that far. You have to agree with me. I I love that you've got there. I because I, I I think when I had my daughter, I decided there was no dieting talk, no body talk, yeah, no nice. complaining, no I'm fat, I'm this, I'm that. Because as women, we can say to your daughter, you've got a beautiful body, or you look so lovely, or you. But unless we're doing it, mm. unless we're owning it, it doesn't stick the way no. what we do does and we all know that right actions speak louder than words yep. that's as old as the hills but I didn't come home to loving my own body until relatively recently because I think I came from this our, our kind of family status quo was the cultural status quo fat is bad so big is bad which is culturally insensitive unintelligent mm. just um, plain wrong there are people who are bigger who are just as healthy people who are skinny who are unhealthy and people who are dealing with genetic issues, there are so many reasons and variables and intrigue going on over there that it's actually none of my business. Mm. And so when I put on what I perceived to be a lot of weight, I would hate myself because I was now in the big category. Yeah. And big was bad. It was just like this blanket kind of belief. And it's been, and I realized that that never ever produced like hating myself while I was carrying weight never produced anything positive mm. it never produced a sustainable way of being in the world that made me healthier mm. so it's like you're saying you you famine feast famine feast famine ricochet yeah. back and forward punish then you know give up and all of that kind of reactionary edge action yeah coming home to how I am now as like a 50 year old with having had three babies and with some perimenopausal weight, I just feel so great. Well, you look gorgeous. Thanks. But I think I look gorgeous because I feel great. I think I feel great. I, I'm taking, I'm eating well. I'm doing some movement because movement makes such a difference. Yeah. But that moving, making any kind of adjustment or addition out of yes and it's entirely different from I gotta lose the pounds, I gotta shape up, I gotta yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this is just an entirely different energy. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. It's an absolutely different energy. And I think also when you change that energy and you change that mindset, it makes going out and doing moving your body however you want to do it, it makes it easier. Totally. Because if you look at it it's it, it, instead of it's punishing me for putting on the pounds, instead of why don't you go, Hey, what a privilege it is to be able to move my body like this why don't I go and enjoy it? And while I do that, I'll soak up this beautiful view as I walk around the waterfront. Or why don't I take my kids for a walk? Or in, at the moment, Harley, we went. I, I work on the radio, so I do the. I'm on the Hits Drive show, and we are part of the Weebix Kids Triathlon. So we awesome. went down. I took my daughter down to it. She said, "I want to do that. I want to run like that." So we've gone and got the running shoes, and we're going to start running together. And that's going to be, I think. I mean, she'll be fitter than, fitter than me, which is a bit of a concern, but that's fine. Um, but like, you know, look at it as stuff that you can do with your kids and teach them about it as well because I don't want Harley to ever look at her body and go, oh, don't like this. Mm. This is no good. Why is that like that? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. And I think it's like it when there's a very narrow frame. And I know we're all, you know, the anti-social media at the moment and, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket because of social media, which of course is not. Um, the world is just a complex place. It's, it's a mind, isn't it? It's a mind. It's a mind. <laughs> Don't worry, your kids are young enough. We will have figured out a bit oh, more. God, I hope so, there'll be, honestly, yeah. there will be. There, there, there has there, to be a shift. Yeah, there will be a shift, and there will be fallout now. But I do think something social media has given us has is is a breadth of oh, yeah. you know uh, cultures, exposure to body shapes, exposure to ideology, exposure to. So there is this ability I think for women to see that the script for beauty is much broader than when all of our mags tv shows and movies were curated by a very narrow group of humans mm. this is the script for female beauty you know if my daughter and I were talking about vagina shapes like all oh, it's actually labia that that are twins and another girl and they were chatting to each other and then they're like oh why is your vulva why is your vulva like that and they were like, it's not supposed to be like that. Because there were two of them and they were like, this is how it's supposed to be. Where are your flappy bits? <laughs> like, you don't have those flappy bits. Where are they? And they're like, oh, um, just, they don't have them. So then they just went on an investigation and found out, oh, they, they come in all different shapes different and shapes sizes. And There's just not one ideal vulva shape. But we're told that there is. Every cartoon is 
Yep. Just one little triangle. That's yeah. it. It's that little, no cute little flappy bits. No, none of those. Barbie's really got a <laughs> simple <laughs> operation going on here. <laughs> Barbie's a unit. But any time we get caught in... Like, this is masculinity. This is a torso for a man. Mm. This is the chest of a man and the six-pack of a man. That's not the shape men are. No, it's not. Like, it 12 always... of them get to be that shape. Yeah, good and, and good for them. Yeah. But um, in reality, um, I, I, it's funny. Like, I've talked a lot about the relationship with um, exercise. It's also my relationship with food that's changed and, and what I'm feeling my body with. Um, but I don't know why I've gone on that tangent. You were just talking about vaginas. I think it threw me slightly, but um, <laughs> I just wasn't ready for it. I just, I'm just giving me the wine. Um, but yeah, no. They're I'm good to... things, vaginas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that go. Okay. They're really amazing. It's a what that whole just learning about the body, and I think especially after having a child and I learning know. about how that whole process works. You're like, cheap is the. There's the all those wild. extra spaces that to allow bits like, and bobs, and you're I like, know. where am I putting that child? I know that's called a Douglas's pouch. He got to name Douglas's pouch. Are the folds in the vagina that that mm. are that just sit there like waiting to go oh, right. if they're needed for a like a human to come out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wild, isn't it? Wild. Wild. And how that your body is producing a hormone that creates the ability for your joints and everything to move so yeah. that baby can come out. It's like, wow, it really has thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> really has thought of everything. We would say fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah, yeah. So good. Yeah, it is great. Crazy. It is wild. Um, anyway, I was putting you off with my vulva talk. No, oh, look, I'm into it. I just didn't realise we were going to go up to sit sip my coffee. <laughs> Sorry, it's all it's on offer before twelve. Oh, oh no, there we go. No, it's almost past twelve. I'll have the wine now. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, ha, um, you know, there's a thread runs through it. She'll be right. We've got a couple of other she'll be right attitudes that I'm wondering about, and mm-hmm. and I know that you spoke about your miscarriage. I had a miscarriage too, and um, at work one day when I was filming, and I, um, I. I didn't know how to commemorate or remember or make that baby count because somehow it impacted me. It was real to me. Thanks. And I know that you've been through miscarriages. How was that for you and how did you hold on to yourself? I didn't. I think I lost myself for a bit, um, to be perfectly honest, because I was really lucky with uh, my daughter. Everything was sort of as planned and I guess when you're a working woman and certainly when you've built a career over a a period of time I was very hell-bent on having the utmost control over when and how and what was going to happen in that pregnancy I get pregnant today and then we'll have the baby then and then I'll go back to work then that was how I my first pregnancy and by all accounts that was exactly what happened so I was very very lucky I didn't realize just how lucky until I decided to we, we decided to try again and have another baby and I, I remember it all so well because when you are, when you've experienced being pregnant no one else knows but you and I for me it was like the second I was pregnant my whole body changed I knew it instantly everything from my fingers to my toes like I could tell you I was pregnant like literally I woke up and I was like I'm pregnant so if I do a test today I'll tell you right now I'm pregnant wow. um, but just I just think I don't know it was just intuition but also just knowing my body better I um, my relationship when I talk about my relationship with my body I learned a lot about it between Harley um, and trying to lose the baby weight that's when I learned the most about myself um, and my body so I felt very in touch with it I yeah. was the fittest I'd ever been yeah. when I fell pregnant um, after Harley I was the happiest I'd ever been um, my head was in a really good space I was loving work I was loving life and I was like this is such a great thing that we're going to do here um, and I went to an obstetrician and they said yeah keep exercising the way you are you know absolutely um, it's not till it gets a bit you know, your bump gets bigger, that it gets in the way, and, you know, you have to adapt accordingly. There's certain ad things. So I'm learning all about it, great. And I remember I went to an, uh, an F45 class, which I'd done the whole way through the pregnancy to date, and that was absolutely fine. Um, it was at the early stages, so we were, I was only about eight or nine weeks pregnant at this point, and it was, you know, like just our happy little secret. You know how you sort of... Um, I've since learned that actually I think you should tell everyone from the minute you're pregnant. I agree. Because you actually need that support if it does go the way you hope it does. Mm. So I've gone to my 45 class and then I've gone home and I've taken coffee home and I've had my decaf because now I'm pregnant and I've taken it home. I think I had oat milk. I was very pregnant. Oh, wow. Very pregnant friendly. Yeah. And my wee girl was there and then Guppy and I were doing sort of a quick handover and he was going off to um, 
to, to, to go on travel and play cricket because that's what he does. And I remember standing at the door, holding Harley, knowing I was pregnant, watching him drive down the drive and thinking, this is going to, we're going to, I'm going to do this with two babies soon. Like, this is amazing. I can do, I just so remember that feeling of him driving off and it was still a little secret. He drove off. Um, and then that afternoon I started getting a very sore stomach and I rang the obstetrician. He said, it's probably just because it's still relatively early and your, your body's just remembering that it has to start to stretch and move and it's about the time, like, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Um, and then uh, woke up the next day, was not feeling fine, started bleeding, couldn't get hold of Guppy because he was playing in the game, and I, I just knew something was wrong straight, o- straight away, I think. Um, once there was blood, it was like, oh, dear, oh, no. And then mm. I just my family had gone away and I was all very alone I mean, the iPad did a lot of parenting that day for me while I basically just lay on my bathroom floor and miscarried the baby um, and I didn't tell anyone because there was an element of shame for me um, my, this body that I'd been so mean to maybe it was karma because I'd I'd been so horrible to it for such a period of time um, I think in a lot of ways part of me felt like it wasn't real it had happened to somebody else maybe and I just saw it from a different like I, there was a lot of I was in a very strange place with it um, and then I became obsessed with becoming pregnant so then it was just an obsession of getting pregnant like I've got to we've got to get pregnant now I need to be pregnant yesterday because the timings this is not working this is not part of the plan I don't I don't have miscarriage because I had a perfectly healthy easy pregnancy well it wasn't easy but you know pregnancy last time so why isn't this happening um and then obviously COVID happened and then I got pregnant again um and this time um everything seemed fine I was really sick I was the sickest I'd ever been of my pregnancy experience and um the doctor kept saying to me because you couldn't go in because of COVID. But it's good. No, the sicker you are, the better it is because... It's like a comfort. It it's shows like that you're thing. actually pregnant. Yeah, it's growing. It's all changing. Obviously, things are working out. And I was I was so crook. My eyelashes started falling out. My Ooh. eyebrows, my hair. Heavens. <laughs> there was a lot of vomit. Wow. Like I can, we were living with my mum and dad at the time because we sold our house just before the lockdown. Yeah, 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 naturally, perfect. which was yeah, great. Yeah, I missed the boom. That would be nice. Um, sold it, you know, just... And anyway, um, I remember mum coming in to talk to us and I just had my <laughs> head like in the toilet and she's just carrying on as normal because I was always sort of in the sick, t- yeah. <laughs> which was cool. But it was actually, um, it, as it transpired, I, I went in to have a scan at about, I think it was about 11 weeks and I hadn't had one yet and the baby had died and it was making me, that was what was making me sick because the sack was growing but the baby had, had died so I had a missed miscarriage and that was probably... I don't know. I don't know if that was worse than you know. And then having to have the surgery to yeah. remove the baby, and I there's just like little pockets of bits that I have very vivid memories of. Like so, going into the surgery, you have to go by yourself. COVID lockdown. No one else. No one else knew I was in there because I hadn't told anyone I was pregnant because I hadn't hit the twelve weeks yet. So you go in, and then I remember being wheeled into. Actually, the, the other thing that stuck out to me is that every single one of the nurses or doctors who came in there that was a female had all experienced a miscarriage in some way, shape, or form. And I was like, jeez. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't think we were the only one? When I had my first miscarriage, it was sort of like, have a lemonade popsicle, put a wheat bag on it, and you'll be right. Um, This time was a little bit more serious with the surgery, having to remove the baby. But I remember going in, and on the whiteboard that they have in there, it said evacuation of the uterus. And I remember just sobbing, going, I don't want to have it evacuated. Like, I I want this baby. I don't Mm. want want it. I I, I want this baby. I want Mm. this baby. And it was horrific. And then I just didn't handle anything particularly well after that. I, I was very sad all the time. Yeah. And then again with the shame and the, all these Fine. different moments, what have I done? What did I do to deserve this? Where did I, where did I get it wrong? What, was it the exercise? Because for the second pregnancy, I just didn't exercise for the second miscarriage. I was new. I just wasn't going to move at all. You know, I'll just sit here for nine months mm-hmm. and that'll that'll be fine. Um, so I was racking my brain with what I did there. And um, obviously I'm in a privileged position in a lot of ways to have a platform in which I could talk about it. And I just made a decision. I talked to my husband about it and I said, I just, I don't want anyone to feel this alone because I love you, but you've got no idea what I am going through. Because <laughs> it, it happened it happened around you, it didn't happen to you, you know? I do. It's, it, and I'm sure maybe, you? you know, with your husband, like they can't relate they don't know what it's like when your body gets taken over by this other little being that all of a sudden becomes you know and I yeah so I decided to once I felt confident enough and actually as it transpired I got pregnant I'm very good at getting pregnant 
Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when I got pregnant again and I got a comfortable amount through the pregnancy for me, mm-hmm. in my mind, I felt comfortable enough to talk about it on radio and the response was quite um, unbelievable actually. And it was hard too in a lot of ways because I want to talk to everyone about their experience but everyone's experience is so different with it mm-hmm. and I can't take anyone's pain away as much as you'd love to be able to do that for everyone and one of the things I've learned in my life is that it's actually sometimes quite good to sit in your grief instead of the she'll be right and I did sometimes it would hit me when I least expected I'd be in the you know in the wardrobe and I just have to sit and shut the door a little bit and just have a wee cry or in the shower or on the drive home and it's okay just to sit and have a really good cry because that's what I needed to do and and um I have since learnt for me personally in my experience the babies that I lost in getting my son it was always Teddy that was trying to get to me it's just for whatever reason that vessel wasn't quite right to get him here and he is my soulmate he belongs to me and um, so I'm so grateful that I kept the faith and was able to to um, have him because he is oh, he's just he's so special mm. yeah that's a really that's a big heidinger that's a decent journey to go through and I I love that your response was to reach out in your grief and pain in the hope that other women aren't alone in theirs and I think it's such a um, generous and profoundly important move for us to say this is not just me succeeding and this is not just me you know pregnant and winning in life or whatever and winning at life this is actually me living my life with all its joys and all its sorrows and that the sorrows deserve space in the same way the joys deserve space they're both part and parcel in a good way of our lives and I hear you because I I mean even in both ways you know that the, the the first reaction to shame or blame like to shame yourself you've failed as a woman or you've done something and you know blaming yourself or the shame of this had all this potential but now it's gone and it, and I and I am I am to blame so they're sort of intertwined aren't they mm. that and, and they don't they don't they don't actually answer the question they don't actually bring us home to the fact that things happen in life that we have no control over. Mm. There's no control. Sometimes the body lets go of a pregnancy because it literally wouldn't survive. Mm. So the body says, this one we let go of. And sometimes we lose babies because of other reasons. So I think that, yeah, that I'm with you. I had um, (coughs) talked about it in another podcast, was invited around to a a kind of a, a miscarriage commemoration where we all just sat and cried and laughed and were together remembering this baby that didn't get to be and and I got my pregnancy test out of the rubbish bin um, and was like this baby existed this was my baby Mm. and just because this baby isn't here now doesn't mean I have to pretend this baby didn't exist and so I said to my husband we have to do something we just have to remember made him sit in the lounge and be sad all night I think you know just try to to acknowledge the life and to acknowledge the grief and like you say find a way to release it to sort of almost offer the grief back and 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 that validates I think the fact that that was a life that didn't didn't make it you know yeah yeah and that's that was the thing that shocked me the most is how many people would go I was only 10 weeks pregnant no no that was 10 10 weeks weeks. you you had a baby there and that was a baby and that was your baby and and I, I, I you know I think that 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 is an important thing to remember and um but I was um actually I had like um, friends' mothers reach out to me saying, you know, Laura, I would never have talked about having a miscarriage. You just get on and did it. And with my first miscarriage, when I was still bleeding, you know, I went to work the next day and stuff, and you do these things, and you're like, why did I what put myself I through that? Mm-hmm. What would I possibly put myself through that for? Because it was the she'll be right, you just get on with it, it'd be fine, no one talks about it. So you can't ring up work and go, oh, I've had a miscarriage, I'm sorry, can I not come into work? Because... Like, work would have responded very differently to how I thought they would have you know yeah. that in my mind I'd created this thing for myself like I didn't tell you I was pregnant so I can't um, tell you I can't I'm... tell you I've now miscarried this baby mm. whereas work would have gone take as long as you like I'm pretty sure mm. um it's it's a terrible thing this isolation that we put ourselves in around that whole miscarriage thing uh, it's it's frightening how often it happens I think it's frightening too how we I think you need to invite safe people people into your vulnerable spaces yeah. but vulnerability is in fact um this p- 
part, undergirding fabric of life. We are vulnerable. We're vulnerable yes. to a flood or to a miscarriage or to, um, you know, we're vulnerable to life happening, yeah. and and that we aren't alone. That we aren't that we aren't the only ones who are vulnerable. Everybody is, yes. and that in fact vulnerability is in some ways such an incredible strength because despite all this vulnerability, we carry on, you know, and carry on together, and carry on learning, and carry on growing, and carry on um, making our way yeah. through both the, the the tough times and the high times. I think for a long time I thought vulnerability was a weakness, but actually it is, like you mentioned, it is a strength. To be vulnerable and to be be okay with being vulnerable, it's an incredibly strong move. And um, I think especially for my kids, I want them to, to know that mum can be vulnerable and sometimes it's really hard. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's really hard. Um, but, you know, I think that's that's important. And it was funny, I, I studied to be an actress. It's going really well. <laughs> and um, <laughs> And one of the things that they always said to me is, Laura, you've got to just show us a little bit more vulnerability. And I'd be like, I'm funny, not vulnerable, thanks. I can do the comedy, if she wrote that, but I have been doing the vulnerability. You know, and, I, I don't, and it, was a, it was honest to God a thing that I did. Um, and I think talking about miscarriage was the most vulnerable I would, I'd ever been. Um, in a platform where I yeah. share my, my stories. With my friends, I'm probably a little too vulnerable. Oh, they're probably sick of me. Nah, um, they're not. Um, but, they know. but it was always a thing, and so I was scared to be vulnerable. So... Um, but I, no, I've since learned that it is a it is a strength and there's a power in being vulnerable. How does that play out though when you're working in a space that's lots about men's sport? Traditionally, it's been you've been you've covered. Well, a lot you of don't sport. be vulnerable there. No, come on, <laughs> <laughs> there's no like, vulnerabilities. I cry in sport too, which is terrible because no. I get very. I just am either so happy for them or I feel their pain or I like because I being married to an athlete, I see how hard he works and what it means to him. And people don't often realize for, for them it's just a, a person representing their country doing their sport you know but you know I see the hard graft and what goes on and what we're eating and hey, all the exercise the extra training sessions the work he does for his mental health you know all these things so he can be the best version of himself and that's not always not always gonna go the way you want it to even and when so you've done everything all of the you work possibly all can of the things, sometimes you will fail and actually in a sport like cricket um, you'll fail more more often than you succeed, which is it's a frightening statistic, really, if you think about it. But that's just the way it is. That's just sport, and that's why we love it, because it takes us on a journey. It's the, the theatre of sport and the jeopardy and the jeopardy the and who knows and, and oh my lord and oh here Could we go it be? And, oh not a super over yeah so um, so the sport thing was interesting. Um, I certainly developed a, a, a thick skin through it, through it. Because did you get did you get shit from the sidelines? Oh yes. What kind of what what? Um, the way I look. Um, so people making comments. People making comments. The way I look. Um, how like I? Like you look very nice today, Laura. Exactly like that was how they say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And no. with alcohol and large groups have been um, showing off to each what other. What was always the most interesting was when the women would say stuff. Because yeah. you're like, God. And I, I I was actually talking to Ricky Swinnell, who's a broadcaster I work with and we were talking about there's been a real shift in the last I'd say five years where women are very good at championing other women now and if you don't want to champion other women around you you'll get left behind and I work with some brilliant female broadcasters I think we were all often pitted against each other mm. and um, I've just noticed it particularly yeah we were, we were talking about it how there's a real change like I am more than comfortable to come on this podcast and say I think that Ricky Swinnell is one of the best broadcasters we've got and I don't feel threatened by saying that out loud. I 100% believe yeah. it and she's brilliant yeah. um, and she's killing it on the world stage I'm proud just to sit and watch yeah. her pave the way for other women who might want to do that you know that wouldn't always happen before now what was it like for you would you do you find that when you worked in the tally side of it that I women think, were well I think that I think that. I think that if we bought into the mentality of there's only a very small space and so there's only one or two women up there, so then that's it, it's you or someone else. Mm. I think that's when that's like you've got to pull somebody down to get up, whereas m my perception is there is enough there is enough love, there is enough attention, there is enough of everything to go around. Like there is enough. We even know there's enough food in the world to go around. It's just that some people have more than they need. You know, like it's there COVID. Are... I just got a bit panicky. I, I bought a lot of tuna. I'm so sorry. I'm share, so sorry. I'm so sorry. Share, Laura, share. Do you need some tuna? <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's this and I think especially with attention, like there's enough. So I was I was one to promote other women or support other women yeah. or, or try and encourage them to 
to take a step up, yeah, but probably less pitting in terms of there were, I think in a space like sports where there were so few, yeah, then it's yeah. like hard one and now that you're here, you've got to stay. You know, like I yeah. think there was probably a different pressure on you guys. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, I think you did right. And, and, uh, but now it's, it's a really lovely place to be because we, we do champion each other. So, yeah, so I did, to, to ask, answer your question, yeah, I did get a lot of grief um, from the sidelines. It would either be about what I look like, how I got to the position that I'm in. Right, yeah. Um, and look, which would involve probably, sleeping with somebody, I suspect. Somebody, um, multiple. No, um, that's what the, that's what that's the suggestion what I, always was. Yeah. Um, you know, if it wasn't written down, it was yelled at me. Um, and look, I, I'm very aware of marrying a cricketer and what that looked like, but <laughs> I really like him. Yeah, he's a great, <laughs> turns out. He's actually a great guy. Um, so, actually had nothing to do with work, but... Yeah. Um, that who plays cricket is not your fault. It's not my fault, actually. Mm. And um, if anything, we just... We just really like cricket. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was... It, look, I've learned a hell of a lot um, about myself and how tough I am. And I am a lot tougher than anyone gives me credit for. Um, and I had to learn very fast how to do that. Um, and I hit that... I would sort of use humour as a way to deflect from how much initially it hurt. Mm. Um, when, when people would say stuff to me. But um, now I much to my mother's disgust, every now and again I'll, I'll bite back, I'll say the odd thing here and there. Um, where, again, it was around pregnancy, I remember very specifically uh, um, there was a thing in, oh, in, on the Herald, never read the comments, never read the comments. And there was, you know, God knows all sorts of speculation about, you know, who was the father and mother. <laughs> and then you're like, oh God, give me a break. Anyway, but there was this one, and I clicked on the profile and looked. It was fun. It used to make me. It used to make me chuckle that most of these men, grown men, who would write these things about me, had children and daughters, and they'd be on their profile picture of their Facebook page, and you'd be like, "Right, gosh, I hope no one goes to your daughter's work and yells that at her, or writes this on the internet about her." But there was one who was um, a groundskeeper at one of the cricket grounds I was working at that day, and it was like, "Oh, don't make it too easy for me." So. <laughs> I got my hair and makeup done, not especially for this moment because I was going on the telly. Went flying around the boundary to the groundskeeper's shed, and I just said, "I just thought I'd come and ask you directly, who was the father then?" Because I am f- absolutely perplexed as to who it must be. If it's not my husband and the guy I've been with for the last seven years, who is it? Because I am. I better make some calls. And he just, and I said, "Your mum must be so." Pretty. Because what a thing to write about a person you don't know at all. So good for you. <laughs> so funny when you face to face. Face to face. But yes, yeah, so mum didn't love one did that. But, um, that sounds fabulous. Oh look, it was a great all. moment. I mean, <laughs> just quietly, I can pretend it wasn't, but it was. But you know, it's don't it's, it's it's. Um, I don't do that so much anymore. But, but it's it is. There is something about that, eh? Like where you're like, I'm just gonna show up in all of my humanity with and, my hair full yeah. hair and makeup and ask the question. Sorry, I'm just wondering what what you thought. What are you there. thinking? Yeah, what were you thinking? Uh, look, and there's a lot of females who have experienced similar things, and we've probably all done the she'll be right, um, which we shouldn't do because that's not okay. Mm. What happens there? And um, I I mean. Yeah, I learned how to be very, very resilient. I, there was another comment that I got. I remember walking around the boundary. And for, and it was so sad because I had a real girl power moment. I, my daughter was in the pavilion. I had to go and breastfeed her. I'd just finished my first cross. My mum was in the pavilion. And I was walking around the, the boundary. And a man yelled out to me, did you have the baby or did you eat the baby? Because I still hadn't lost the weight. Well, I'd had the baby four weeks prior, so that was probably why I hadn't lost the weight. And I was like, wow, here I am just like super proud that I was out of the house. <laughs> totally, it's a big deal. Um, are you going to yell at me? Oh, wow, yeah. Went and cried in the toilets that day. But that was the hormones, I'm sure. But it, yeah, I, um, yeah, I've copped a bit of grief over the years. Is it changing? Has it changed? No. Oh, no, not that I've seen. Oh, I suppose online, maybe there's just not as much about me now. And with COVID, I haven't been at the grounds as much as I used to be. I don't get, I, I, I've probably tuned it all out now. Yeah. I don't look, I don't go looking for it. I think in the okay. early stages when you're probably mm-hmm. a bit like, um, I went looking for it, um, but I don't now, which is a nice place to be. It is a nice place to be. Eh? Blissfully because, ignorant. Because essentially, when people say stuff like that, they are not talking about you. They are talking about themselves. And I know that can be hard to get out of Oh, no, around. I think they've got some bigger issues going on there if yeah. that's what you think is, is okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good luck to your kids. But how do you how, like? It's how do we how do we live our lives and essentially be responsible for what we say and think and mm-hmm. how we are in the world and understand that what is coming out of other people's mouths originates from their bodies and yeah. their ways of seeing and how they feel about and themselves. how they feel about themselves yeah. it doesn't really have a lot to do with us and I think we spend so much time worrying about what people do think about us when they're really thinking about themselves but when they say stuff it's like actually you're talking about yourself you're oh, projecting yeah. your stuff onto the world like I project my stuff onto the world so I'm going to make sure my project is as clean as possible you know as yeah. well as possible and blah 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 yeah, it's a direct reflection of how they feel about themselves. Yeah. And I have learned that. And I'm actually very comfortable with that now. So if you want to come to my work and yell at me, I probably won't hear because um, <laughs> I'm not listening. I'm not listening for it now. If you want to stop and talk to me and tell me how great you think my husband is or how cute my kids are, I'll absolutely have a conversation with you about it. But I don't, I don't hear the bad stuff anymore because I choose not to. Yeah. I'd rather not. Um, and it, like you say, it's, just, it's, it's literally got nothing to do with me. And like I said earlier, your opinion of me is also none of my business. If that's how you want to feel about me and that makes you feel better and you can go to bed at night thinking, God, I really dislike that Laura McGold. Well, good for you. You know, go well. Go well. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't have any feelings about that anymore. I used to. But there are things I can control and there are things that I can't. And uh, I'd rather worry about the things that I can't control. I like it. I think we can all take something from that. Just love it. Just unhack that caboose well once you realise that I think it's actually it's quite a weight off your shoulders it is isn't it you can walk around with your head held high and you can spend more time going has that mould changed yeah what's that <laughs> oh I better get that in my mould uh, folder <laughs> hang on I'll take a photo of yeah, it and I'll yeah, file yeah. it on the mould mole. in the mould album <laughs> I'm going to start a mould album I'm going to call it Mole Laura album. Yeah, I'm going to see. I'm going to see you pictures of my moles. We yes, can please. Yeah. We can, I have to have two folders. The yeah, Laura, Laura's moles. Folders, my moles. Yeah. My moles. Laura's moles. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question? Which is, what would your would, would Laura McGoldrick? She's 85, um, and I don't know. Maybe she's at a cricket game. Oh Lord. Still, you know. Still. Maybe she's, maybe she's holding some grandchild's hand. I don't know. Same. Anyway, just putting it out there, kids. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Harley, you're five. Just relax. You've got plenty of time, girl. <laughs> but what does your 85-year-old, um, vibrantly alive, still moving in the morning, Laura McGoldrick, say to you today? I think she's telling me that it's okay to say no to the odd thing. And it's really important to be present because time is so precious. And I'm learning that the older I get, which seems cruel because I wish I knew that a little bit earlier. But I think she's telling me to also be really proud of who I am and who I've learned to be. And that's just me. Because it took me a long time to realise that I don't have to be anything that anyone wants me to be. I can just be myself. And that's absolutely perfect. Perfect. Um, And I think, yeah, telling me just more to accept that. Because, you know, you go through those stages of, you know, worrying, is this how I should do it? Is it... Just do it how you want to do it and how it feels right to you. Um, God, she talks a lot, doesn't she? Um, Which is one of her gifts. Yeah. <laughs> if, she, if she could teach me how to rein it in from time to time. No, I think, yeah, I think that self-acceptance and to be proud of who I am. Sounds like you and your 85-year-old are going to get on great. I think so. I think so. A few gins. Yeah. A few gins. Yeah. And the son of the crew will be nice. Maybe with an umbrella, because she'll be protecting her skin. Actually, oh, I'll have one of those big hats. You seen those hats? Are basically, oh, just man. it's like wearing a parachute. Those are great hats. So fabulous. I have a very big hat. It's all the bigger the hat, the better. Yeah, you can get your shoulders under those puppies. Oh my! And the kids <laughs> under. <laughs> well, under. Just, just tuck, tuck them in, in. Tuck in here. Tuck in here. Come on, Teddy. In you come. Um, yeah. Awesome. Easy. Thanks so much for chatting. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I loved it.